In the heart of the night, this world were bright, we would set it alight. In the heart of the night, in the heart of the night, this world were bright, we would set it alight. In the heart of the night. I am Anthropomantic Fiend, and I do horror-related things on the internet. So today, I am continuing with my long string of Lugosi reviews. Got this, and I've got at least one more Lugosi movie coming up. Today, I'm talking about Invisible Ghost. This is a movie that came out in 1941. Stars Bella Lugosi, obviously. I don't think there are really any other notable actors in this one. But the premise for this is very interesting. There are, are going to be some minor spoilers here, but I can't really talk about what's happening in the movie at all without spoiling just this tiny bit. And you understand this within like the first 10 minutes of the movie, so it's not that big a deal. Bela Lugosi is this fairly wealthy guy. He's another guy with a big ornate mansion like we've had in I think all of these movies, pretty much. He is pretty much an average guy, except he's, you know, extremely rich. He was in some kind of car accident before the movie starts, and it was like years and years ago, and I think some people died or were injured, and he has lost his wife. I don't think she's supposed to be dead, but he just doesn't know where she is. I don't remember the details, but uh, she is gone. She might have even run away with somebody else, I don't know. But Lugosi, like, every year will, on their anniversary, he will imagine that she is there with him and set a place at the table for her and talk to her. And he had this line where he's like, after dinner we are taking a long walk. And I thought that was funny. That being said, his wife is not dead and she's not really gone either because there's this guy who I think works at his house. I honestly don't know who he is or what he does there or why he's there, but he and his mother have been keeping Mrs. Kessler in this cellar, in this basement, in their house and feeding her and Nobody knows where she is, but she's there, and it's it's pretty pretty messed up, especially since she's kind of oblivious to everything that's going on. She has very clearly snapped, but she does want to leave. She will get out of the house and, in the middle of the night, go to see Lugosi, and she, uh, he will see her through the window, and this switch will be turned in his head, and he will go and kill people. And so there've been murders going on in this house for ever and ever, and nobody knows who it is or why it's happening. But we know it's Lugosi basically from the get-go. So it's a murder mystery, except we already know who the killer is. It's just the characters trying to figure it out. This sort of weird mental thing that happens to Lugosi is almost supernatural. They never truly explain what's happening and it defies logic just enough while staying in the bounds of reality, and it creates this cool, creepy, horror, thriller, mystery-type movie, and I really enjoyed it. This one, like a lot of the movies that I've talked about, has super melodramatic music, as was the standard in the 30s and the 40s for horror movies. Unlike some movies, like... Frankenstein, Dracula, The Human Monster, slash Dark Eyes of London, which I reviewed last time. It's not just like a little bit of music here and there and then silence throughout. It really does make use of the music throughout the movie to accent emotional scenes, and I enjoy that when the movie really is making proper use of its soundtrack, because as much as I love Dracula, and I love Frankenstein, I occasionally will just kind of feel that something's lacking when it's just silence, even though that can be creepy. 
and I really enjoy the version of Dracula that has Philip Glass's soundtrack. I think that adds a lot to the movie, honestly. The music is not standout, but it's decent and it's used well in the movie, so I enjoyed that. Acting is good and, you know, the characters are all honestly fairly rounded. They're like based in sort of the character types you would have in these movies, but they're not that per se. You've got Lugosi and he's playing the killer as he would in most of these movies, but he's not, you know, this melodramatic evil aristocratic vampire or mad scientist or something, even though I love it to pieces when he does that. In this movie, he's more this tortured soul with this dark side that he doesn't know how to control. If you've seen The Black Cat and his performance as Verdegast in that movie, it's not unlike that, except he doesn't go as completely morbidly insane as Verdegast does at the end of that movie. Spoiler alert, it, it gets very dark for 1934. Lugosi is not super melodramatic in this, even though I enjoy that. He's much more subdued and subtle and just sort of this tortured soul and has sort of eerie moments where he'll go into madness. It's not the greatest performance I've seen in my whole life, but it's, it's good. And the other characters and the actors playing them do a good job. The characters are, again, sort of based in these types. You've got Lugosi's daughter, who's in love with this one guy, and you've got the servants in the house, and this grumpy detective character, who more or less is a character, honestly. He's just got this big cigar, and he's going around yelling at everyone, and I found that amusing. But the other characters, they follow these types that have been set up by movies before, but then the story does something different with them. Again, it's not a traditional murder mystery. We already know who the killer is. And there's this weird supernatural element, and characters die who you don't think are going to die because it's set up to be one thing and then death comes in and makes it something different, which I thought was cool. The one problem that I did have was that we've got these servant characters and one of them, Evans, is this black guy and every movie in the 1930s and 1940s tends to, you know, have these typed characters who are these very sort of subdued uh yes sir no sir just black servant characters that's one of my biggest problems with a movie like son of dracula i know probably uh most people watching a movie like that at that time would have thought nothing of it but it rubs me the wrong way every time i see it that being said this movie is kind of better about that because the actor who plays evans is really really good and you can kind of tell he wasn't written to be this black stereotype. He was written to be this snarky servant character, and he's got a lot of personality. But I'm sure that the actor who played Evans would not have been able to get any other role in a movie like this at this time, which is sad, but yeah. Ugh. So that is my, honestly, my only gripe with this movie and uh it's still not okay but it was a product of its time and you know ugh. visually speaking it doesn't really grab you the way some movies do the the camera angles and stuff aren't particularly remarkable but there are some very beautiful eerie shots uh, especially at night, there's a really cool shot of Kessler's wife looking in through the window and it's raining really hard and the lightning's there and uh, there's a couple shots like that but there's rain coming down on the window and distorting her and then it'll switch to be looking at Kessler from outside and he'll be sort of warped by the rain and those shots were really cool. And again, it's another sort of spooky old mansion, and those always tend to be really, really beautiful. Not not gothic, it's not Victorian, but it's an, it's an old spooky mansion, and I love those. I really, really 
liked this movie. From a visual standpoint, it was great. I think if this movie was restored from a sound standpoint and from a, a film quality standpoint, it would be super, super beautiful. But it's, it's one of those low-budget 40s horror movies. I think this one uh, was put out by RKO. There were a lot of those with people like Karloff and Lugosi that weren't huge budget, but the story in this one was good. It had this darkness and strangeness to it that isn't in a lot of these movies, which I liked. All of the acting is good, even if there is definitely some, you know, stereotyping happening that I don't appreciate so much. On the whole, I definitely recommend Invisible Ghosts, especially if you're into the more spooky, atmospheric, black and white type horror movies. I don't think it's a must watch, but it's a solid, creepy movie. So with that said, here are the spoilers for the film. As I was saying, a lot of the things that you think are set up to be like plot threads in the movie that you would commonly see in a lot of movies at this time get thrown out the window when death comes along because we've got this love triangle happening between this guy whose name is Ralph and he's kind of the he-man boyfriend character who you'll see in a lot of these movies. It's basically just, you know, David Manners is Jonathan Harker over and over again. Uh, just kind of his character being, you know, being in love with his wife and, you know, going, what's going on here? And being confused by all the weird stuff. He's just kind of an average guy. And then we've got Kessler's daughter, who he's in love with. There's not a lot to her character either, honestly. There's Cecile, who's one of the servants in the house, and she had seen Ralph for quite a while before that, and they had been in love, but he's now in love with Kessler's daughter. I don't remember her name, but Cecile's not happy about that, and she wants to be with Ralph again, and Ralph doesn't, and there's all this sort of tension happening there. But then Mr. Kessler has one of his episodes and ends up killing Cecile. And this is honestly one of the coolest scenes in the movie because it's not, you know, scored just with spooky melodramatic music or anything. Uh, she's sitting in her room listening to just some easygoing music on the radio, and Kessler comes in with his coat to put it over her head and strangle her with it. When she dies, it's not to this melodramatic, spooky music. It's to just what she's listening to on the radio. And I'm just seeing this horrific scene play out, even though you don't really see what happens to her with this just casual music in the background. That juxtaposition is always really creepy to me. Uh, Evans comes to wake her up in the morning and that scene is really creepy as well because she died before she had the chance to turn the radio off. So it's it's like playing this morning exercise routine and again, very just easygoing and normal. And he's trying to get into the room and he opens the door and she's splayed on the bed, falling off dead. And there's just the radio playing in the background the whole time. And it's very creepy whenever a movie juxtaposes just this music that's supposed to be happy or easygoing or something normal with this horrific scene that's infringed on it. And I thought that was brilliant, especially since a lot of horror movies that come out at this time will, would honestly, for a scene like that, not have you know, this juxtaposition of normal happy stuff with the dark stuff. It would just go full dark and melodramatic and spooky whenever the kills or the horror scenes were happening, which I love stuff like that, but uh, this is honestly a lot more creepy, and I liked that. Cecile gets killed, so right off the bat that whole love triangle thing is gone, although that makes Ralph the suspect, basically based on all this circumstantial evidence and, you know, drama 
between him and Cecile and conversations that have happened that they basically just sort of decide that he's the one who's killed her and he is sentenced to death and we get this long scene of him being basically walked to the chair as they're reciting this prayer to him and it's dark it's really dark and with a movie like this you you know he would somehow miraculously escape or get off the hook but no our like romance that we have set up is just gone because he just dies and it's very bleak although at first you think they've offset that because another character played by the exact same actor just comes to the door the next day and he says, my name is Dixon, which is Ralph's last name. And he just walks in and they're like, who is this guy? How, how did Ralph survive? But it's not Ralph, it's his twin brother, Paul. Eh, I don't know how I feel about that. It was surprising and Ralph didn't get to stay around for a while. So I guess he gets to play another character who doesn't act all that different from Ralph either. And it's dressed in the same wardrobe, so, you know, bleh. The next person who dies is the guy who's been keeping Kessler's wife. I still don't know what his relation in the house is. Is he a servant? Is he just this random homeless guy who's breaking in through the back door and stealing food? I don't know, but he's there. And he happens to be there when Kessler's wife gives Kessler another murdering episode and he kills this guy and he's just found in the room and they know who this guy is so I, I don't think he's a random homeless guy but I don't know what he does at the house either. They find him dead on the ground and they take him in and he, then we have a scene in the morgue with his body where his mom starts screaming. The, the dead guy's mom starts screaming because uh, he's not dead, actually. He regains consciousness with what vitality he has left and opens his eyes. But of course, Kessler's there and is trying to ask him who the killer is. And he just dies with his eyes wide open and his mouth gaping. And he just dies of shock after seeing Kessler again. So they don't figure out who it is. I thought that was cool and creepy. We get another kill with him, well, it isn't actually killed this time. It is Kessler having another episode and going to kill somebody. He actually almost goes into Paul's room, but then doesn't. I couldn't tell you why. And Paul sort of hears something at the door. And even though there's all these murders that he's so suspicious of, he just kind of shrugs it off and keeps reading his book or his newspaper or whatever it was which doesn't make sense to me, but I sort of let it slide. Mr. Kessler goes to his daughter's room and almost kills her, but there's, you know, this heavy rainstorm. And for, our, for whatever reason, the lightning snaps him out of it and he goes downstairs and he can't remember what's happening. And you can tell he's kind of tormented at this point. There's some other incidents. Another guy dies and you can tell that he's just sort of resenting what his wife is making him do through this strange supernatural connection that we don't understand. Uh, Cause the next day there's another guy dead. The throat of his wife has been torn out in this portrait that he's got. She's not dead. He's just got this portrait of her that's been hanging there the whole time and its throat has been ripped out. So that was cool. There's more detective work going on and they're trying to figure it out who it is. And, you know, they think it's Evans uh, because, you know, it's always the butler and mm, might be some racism there too. Uh, they start questioning him. And while they're doing that, Mrs. Kessler breaks into the house and starts stealing food and someone catches her and she starts babbling stuff about being dead and wanting to go home and it's pretty creepy and then she walks into the room where Kessler's standing and in front of everybody he goes into this state and then just sort of 
walks trance-like out of the room, and then he's followed, and then he tries to strangle somebody, and she's sort of telling him, I'm dead. I'm dead, Charles, because his first name is Charles, I believe, which I, I keep forgetting. But anyway, he's trying to kill somebody, and they know who the killer is, and she's been saying she's dead, and then she actually falls down dead, and because of this, this supernatural link between the two is broken. He snaps out of it, and he's like, oh, is there anything wrong with his hands around this guy's neck? And they're like, yeah, we, we got the killer. It's you, Mr. Kessler. And he just sort of covers his face in his hands, and he, he does look just really sad. And that's how the movie ends. It's not a happy ending. It's just him being taken into the police. We don't have any kind of romance or the, the, the mansion getting blown up behind him or, uh, you know, any kind of traditional horror ending. It's honestly pretty depressing, and you don't get an ending like that quite as often in these kinds of horror movies. So it's, it's dark for its time, and I really like that. So, once again, if you like creepy, atmospheric, black and white horror movies, I definitely think you should give Invisible Ghost a chance. It's not a must-watch, not the greatest thing I've seen, but it's a solid movie, I think. So that's my review of Invisible Ghost. Thank you for watching. I'll have one more Bela Lugosi movie review on the way, at least. Thanks for watching, and I'll hopefully see you in another video. Bye.